Welcome to today's webinar titled Dual Language Learners, the Latest Social and Emotional Research, brought to you by the NCSL. All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode to provide favorable sound quality during today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Julie Poppy. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the country. My name is Julie Poppy, and I thank everyone for being on the webinar call today, Dual Language Learners, the latest social-emotional development research. Participating today, we have current fellows as well as alumni from the past two years of the program. We also have project staff here. Robin Lipkowitz is right beside me. Allison May is on the line, and likely a few other NCSL colleagues, and also staff from our funder, the Alliance for Early Success. We recognize that some of you may be participating only by phone and not on the webinar platform, and we appreciate your ability to join and listen in. An archived copy of the webinar will be available and posted on NCSL's website shortly. Once posted, Allison will uh, email out the listserv alerting you to the availability of the archived copy. So just a little reflection on my part. I hope everyone um, that attended the second meeting for the third class of the Early Learning Fellows in Minneapolis in mid-August uh, enjoyed themselves. I know we thought uh, there were some real highlights of, of the meeting, um, hearing Doug talk about early math and the two arts covering why we should invest in early childhood. Um, like I said, the staff really enjoyed seeing and talking with all of you. So our goals for the next hour is to make this presentation as interactive as possible. Should you have a question, please note that there are two different ways to ask um, a question from our experts. So one way is via the phone, and we'll open up those lines shortly. And the second way is through the chat box that you see on the webinar platform um, currently. So as we prepare for questions, I'll ask the operator to come back on the line and remind us how to uh, ask the question. So don't worry if you didn't get all that. So I'm going to start the, uh, the webinar. So here's a fact. There are a number of states that have experienced twofold growth of dual language learners uh, during the past two decades. So we're going to take a look at this emerging issue. Uh, the goals for today's webinar, as a participant, you're going to walk away, uh, hopefully, with a better understanding of what and who dual language learners are, what the social emotional needs look like, and, and as well as um, some policy and practice implications. Uh, another goal, I hope, is that we um, start a dialogue with each other and continue offline among the fellows on this emerging issue of dual language learners. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenter, um, but before I, I turn it over to her, I'm just going to briefly talk to you about her bio. As you see on the screen, it's full of great information, so I'm just going to briefly highlight um, some, of the, some of the important is, um, issues. So Tamara Halley is co-director of Early Childhood Development and senior research scientist at Child Trends. Uh, Tamara conducts research and evaluation studies on children's early cognitive and social development, uh, early childhood care and education, family and community supports for school readiness, and school characteristics associated with ongoing achievement and positive development. Among her other work that you see here, her recent work focuses on promoting children's school readiness, um, the optimal development of dual language learners, and the application of uh, implementation of science frameworks. Uh, Tamara's going to talk a little bit more about child trends during her opener and all the wonderful work she's doing um, there. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to turn it over to Tamara, who's going to begin her presentation. Tamara? Okay, thank you so much, Julie, for your introduction and um, hello to all of you. It's really my pleasure to speak with you today about um, work on dual language learners. I wanted to um, briefly go over what I'll be sharing with you today. First. As uh, Julie said, I'll be providing a brief introduction to child trends and what we do. And then I'll go over the definition of dual language learners and provide some demographic information about them. And then I'll follow that by summarizing some of what we know from the research about dual language learners' development and focusing especially on their social emotional development. And finally, I'll summarize some key findings from the research and discuss some policy and practice implications. And we should, even with all of that, have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to stop kind of halfway through uh, to uh, have an opportunity for questions, and then we'll have some more questions near the end. 
So first, I just wanted to briefly uh, tell you about Child Trends. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization, and we have as our mission improving the lives and prospects of children and youth by conducting high-quality research and sharing the resulting knowledge of that research, not only our research, but research from the field, with um, people who make decisions about children, in particular practitioners and policymakers, but also uh, foundations and other funders, uh, and also the general public. And uh, we have as our uh, focus the whole child, meaning that we're interested not only in children's cognitive development, but also their social and emotional development and uh, their physical well-being. And we study uh, children from conception all the way through transition to adulthood, so we take a life course approach as well as a whole child approach. And we study children in the real world. We're interested in real world application of research uh, to policy and practice. And we really do want children to flourish and use uh, high quality research, which means we value objectivity and rigor in the work that we do and the work that we summarize from the field to pursue knowledge development and also knowledge transfer. We're very interested in disseminating um, findings to policymakers and um, other decision makers, and that's why I'm so thrilled to have been asked to share uh, with you during this webinar today. Child Trends was founded in 1979, and as I mentioned, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan research center. We have about 120 uh, staff, most of whom are research staff, but some administrative staff, in, located in, in um, five different states, but our main uh, office is in Bethesda, Maryland. We also have an office in Minnesota and in North Carolina, and we have researchers also in New York City and Colorado. And as you see here on this slide, uh, we cover a host of different uh, topical areas around uh, child well-being, including child poverty, child welfare, education, fatherhood. We have a new Hispanic Institute that studies Hispanic children and youth. Uh, we have researchers that focus on marriage and family formation, on teen sexual uh, behavior and pregnancy, and positive youth development, and we're known for the indicators of child well-being. That is how we derived our name, Child Trends, that we've been following uh, indicators of child well-being for uh, several decades now. As mentioned, I'm one of the co-directors of the Early Child Development Area at Child Trends, and uh, we focus on child uh, development in the first years of life through transition to school um, through age eight. So birth to eight is, is our early childhood focus. And we have uh, many different research approaches that we use in our work, including designing surveys that uh, we've helped to design national surveys of child well-being and the early childhood workforce, as well as work in states and in local evaluations. We also develop measures and uh, do evaluations of programs and systems. Uh, I am uh, very focused on implementation science and implementation evaluation. We do data analysis, both uh, primary data collection and data analysis, as well as secondary data analysis of national and uh, state data sets. And we also do observational studies. Uh, we do qualitative work, such as focus groups and interviews. And we also do literature reviews, summarizing the research um, across the field. And some of that is what I'll be sharing with you today, some literature review work, as well as some secondary data analysis. So after, with that introduction, let me uh, get into the meat of what we're going to talk about today, which is dual language learners. And I'm starting with a definition of dual language learners that's used by the Office of Head Start and many researchers. And it states that dual language learners are young children who are acquiring two or more languages simultaneously. And importantly, they're learning a second language while continuing to develop their first or home language. So these are young language learning children. Um, usually in the first years of life is when you first, by age two, you start uh, to acquire your first few words, 18 months to two years. And um, we're talking about children who would be exposed during that period of time and also uh, through the um, transition to school. Now, although there are, this is an agreed upon definition of dual language learners, in actual practice there are various ways that this group 
is identified in the population. So for example, in the American Community Survey, which is a national survey, they identify these children by finding children living in homes where English is not the only language spoken. So there's more than one language in the home. But in many Department of Education uh, data sets, these children are identified as school-age children coming from homes where the primary language is not English. So that's a subtle difference, but as you see, you can identify um, children differently based on, on that um, various definition. So the term dual language learners encompass um, other terms that you might have heard before, such as li limited English proficient or bilingual or English language learners or English learners, or even um, sometimes you hear language other than English um, spoken. So um, this term dual language learners is the one preferred by researchers because it is not only accu accurate, but it emphasizes the value of the two languages or more than one language. And it also applies outside of an English language focused context. Um, so uh, that is the definition. And now we want to know who are these children? Who are these young dual language learners? According to the American Community Survey, which we just mentioned, there are a little shy of 24 million children between birth and age 17 living in households where English is not the only language. And according to the Department of Education's Digest of Education Statistics from 2013, there are 4.6 million dual language learning students. That is those students whose home language is not English in the K-12 um, system. Most of the dual language learning children in the United States speak Spanish, like two-thirds of them do. Um, so they're a main focus of a lot of um, policy and practice uh, questions. But there are also many other children who are dual language learners who speak other languages, such as Chinese, Vietnamese, Hmong, um, Amharic, other languages. The, the poverty rate among just Spanish language dual language learners is higher than children from English only households, which is of course a risk factor. Yet more dual language learners live in two parent families compared to English only um, households, which is considered a protective factor. So some of these demographic factors can play one way or the other. What's important to note here is that there are many ways that this group of children overlaps with other groups of interest, such as Hispanic children and low-income children, and also children of immigrants. And we'll return to this point later. So now, what do we know about dual language learners' development? Young bilingual children have been found by researchers to have better and more flexible cognitive skills than monolingual children. And this includes their ability to pay attention, to switch attentional focus, and to voluntarily control their behaviors, which is known as inhibitory control. And as you might be familiar from a previous presentation to this group, both attention and, hi and inhibitory control are aspects of executive function skills, which are important foundational skills for both cognitive and social development. Now, while dual language learners have some cognitive advantages, especially um, with executive function skills over monolinguals, they tend to perform less well on reading and mathematics assessments at the beginning of kindergarten than their peers and continue to perform at lower rates throughout elementary school and even into secondary school. And this points out the importance of understanding and using um, English proficiency and how English proficiency affects later um, academic development. And so some research that my colleagues and I have done um, doing some analyses of the ECLSK data set, which stands for the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study Kindergarten Class of 1998-99, which is a nationally representative sample of children entering kindergarten that year and following them longitudinally. We found that among those who are dual language learners, that is, whose home language was not English, um, those who became proficient in English by the end of kindergarten, which was uh, defined by passing a English language screener test, those children did better academically over time compared to dual language learners who became proficient later or failed to become proficient in English. So that just shows you the importance of um, learning English among children who might be learning English as a second language. 
So we seem to know a lot more about um, children's dual language learners' language development and cognitive development than we do about their social and emotional development. And a literature review um, that my colleagues and I did of studies published in U.S. journals between the year 2000 and the year 2011 um, found only 14 peer-reviewed studies that examined social-emotional outcomes among dual language learners. And that was pretty stunning <laughs> that there were so few. But um, despite that there were only a, a little bit of research about this population, a picture of social-emotional development does begin to emerge. And I'm going to share some of those findings with you today. But first, I want to step back and just um, take a moment to talk about what social-emotional development is. Social de emotional development um, is defined as the capacity to form close and secure relationships with adults and peers, and the ability to experience, regulate, and express emotions in ways that are socially and culturally appropriate, and also the capacity to explore the environment and learn from those explorations. And there are several key components to social emotional development, and they include um, self-regulation, which is the ability to focus attention and manage emotions and control behaviors, and it's sometimes also called or uh, known as self-control. Social competence, which is the ability to interact effectively with others and to develop and maintain positive relationships. Social cognition, which is um, a cognitive representation of a child's social experiences in the world, so how children think and understand and make sense of their world and the social relationships that they have. And problem behaviors um, is another component, and this includes um, both externalizing behaviors such as biting or pushing or acting out, and internalizing behaviors such as withdrawal or depression. So um, why do we care about social emotional development? Well, we care about it because social emotional development is one of the five domains of development the National Education Goals Panel identified as essential for children's school readiness and later life success. And, and we also care about it because teachers and parents repeatedly cite cooperation, respect for others, and paying attention as more important than reading and math skills for children's success in kindergarten. And it's it's also important to note that there's evidence linking early social-emotional development with later cognitive and academic outcomes for children. And we've found that um, starting school with poor social-emotional and health um, outcomes is associated with poor academic and behavioral outcomes, for instance, at the end of first grade. So um, now that I've explained what social-emotional development is and why it matters, maybe we can stop for a minute for some questions before I get into some of the findings. Does anyone have any questions? I see, I see something popping up here. I don't see any questions yet in the chat box. Should I keep going? Yeah, yes. Uh, keep going, Tamara. I think this is great. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right, so um, now let me share some of the findings that our recent literature review um, on dual language learners' school readiness found. So the main finding is that dual language learners function at least as well, if not better, than their monolingual English-speaking peers in the social or emotional domain. And so some concrete examples of this are that um, young dual language learners tend to be judged by teachers and observers as having better self-control and interpersonal skills and fewer behavior problems than English-speaking monolinguals. And um, there is some longitudinal evidence that these, the social-emotional advantage of, of uh, dual language learners continues to accelerate at, um, over time. And these are analyses that have been done, again, with the ECLSK data set. So that's pretty um, important to know that, that they're not performing uh, less well, but just as well, if not better, than English-speaking children who do not speak another language. Um, let's move on here. So I just wanted to share with you, again, this is from the literature review, some factors that we found that influence dual language learners' social-emotional development. And there's several of these factors, and they include um, the negative influence of maternal stress 
on uh, social emotional well-being as well as the positive influence of parental involvement in literacy activities such as reading with children. But these two factors could affect any child's social emotional development. There's also several factors that might, might be more specific and unique to the social emotional well-being of dual language learning children. And these include staying in particular schools rather than moving schools. Um, that was found to be associated with better social emotional outcomes for young Latino students through eighth grade. And um, also being in classroom environments that have more supportive teaching um, behaviors in them has a, seems to have a positive effect, and I'll be talking about that in um, a few minutes. And finally, an intriguing finding by Chang and colleagues was that using a child's home language in the classroom was associated not only with better teacher-child relationships, but also improved peer relationships. And specifically, he uh, was looking at uh, Latino students whose teachers used Spanish in the classroom, and those children were less likely to be victims of peer aggression than Latino students whose teachers did not use Spanish in the classroom. So I found that to be very um, intriguing and, and an important finding. So um, here's some summary takeaway messages from across um, the research that I've just presented very briefly. And they are that um, dual language learners tend to have more flexible mental abilities than monolingual. Um, although they tend to perform less well on reading and math uh, assessments, they also, those dual language learners who acquire English proficiency earlier have better academic outcomes than those who acquire English proficiency later. And uh, dual language learners tend to have better social emotional outcomes in general, um, both their pro-social behaviors and fewer behavior problems than English speaking monolinguals. And this intriguing finding that I just mentioned is that the use of home language in early childhood classrooms by teachers and caregivers can have a positive effect on both teacher-child and peer relationships. So now let's talk about and consider some policy implications of this, this work. I think one policy implication is that we need to look at the needs of this group of dual language learners in addition to other subgroups that have been traditionally studied or focused on as part of policy conversations. I mentioned earlier that there's a significant overlap in the populations of um, dual language learners and Hispanic children and dual language learners and low income children. There's also um, a lot of overlap between dual language learners and children of immigrants. And each of these groups is of interest to policymakers and it's worth noting the overlap and including dual language learners needs within relevant policy discussions. But although there's considerable overlap in these groups, they're not synonymous. So you can be a child of immigrants but have your home language be English, for instance, or you could be low income but not a dual language learner. So while these subgroups are all, all have special policy interests, they also have, may have unique characteristics that may warrant different policy levers. So that's important to note. Um, so some other policy implications is uh, promotion and development of a workforce that is uh, equipped to meet the needs of young dual language learners. And um, one implication that follows directly from the literature review, the findings that I presented, is promoting language development in English while still supporting the child's home language in all early care and education settings is important, starting in infancy um, and going through school entries because Infancy and the early years of life are the critical years for language acquisition, and it's important that the home language be supported along with uh, English proficiency. And finally, I wanted to mention um, targeting early childhood education settings for important supports for dual language learners' cognitive and social emotional development by providing resources and curriculum and training. And it's this last point that I'd like to elaborate on for our discussion of practice implications. So um, we know from the research that there are several ways that early care and education environments can support young dual language learners. And these include um, the classroom environment and practices in the classroom environment, such as using a research-based curricula or instructional practices that support both the first and second language and literacy development 
And this can be as simple as intentionally incorporating elements of the child's home language and culture into the curriculum. For example, having signs or posters or words in the home language on the wall or pictures that reflect the child's culture. Another factor is uh, teacher-child relationships. And for this, um, we, as I mentioned before, we know that um, the use of a child's primary language by the teacher is associated with um, better social relationships both with the teacher and with peers in the classroom setting. But uh, importantly, this doesn't mean that the teacher has to be fluent in the home language, but rather it can be as simple as speaking a few words in that language that may help to validate the child's experience and create a welcoming environment for the child and also for the parents of that child. And not only does that help the teacher-child relationship, but it has implications for the child's social status with his or her peers. So children look to teachers for cues about how to treat and interact with their fellow students. And if they see that the child and the language, English language learning or dual language learning child has a, a good relationship with the teacher and sees that the teacher is using that language, uh, the home language with the child, they, they may have, um, they may be more inclined to have um, stronger or better relationships with that child. And it also, uh, research suggests that uh, teachers and educators should monitor and support peer interactions within early care and education settings. So for example, um, pairing children um, of different English proficiency together to help bootstrap children uh, who know English less well but um, also in, uh, interactions between children of different academic performance are also important in this regard. Um, and then also a home and school connection, engaging parents and extending extension activities to families are really key for dual language learners as they are for all young, young uh, students. But educators need to understand the different needs of uh, families who have dual language learners uh, growing up in them. And they also need to value the customs um, of the family so that they can better engage with them. So that is all I had uh, for a presentation. As I, as I said, we have plenty of time for questions and discussion. And I look forward to hearing from you. So thank you. Thank you, Tamara. That was very informative and great. Um, I'm going to ask the operator to come on the line now and remind everyone how to ask a question either through the chat box or um, on the phone. All righty. Thank you very much. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions. If you do have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. Questions will be taken in the order they were received. If you are using a speakerphone, we ask that while posing your question, you pick up your handset to provide favorable sound quality. If at any time your question has been answered, you can remove yourself from the queue by pressing 1. Also, if you have a question for the, uh, on the online portion, you can place your question in the chat box located on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Once you type in your question, you can hit the Send button to submit your question in the chat box, and it will be answered in the order it was received. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question or comment, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. Please hold while we pose for questions. So as we're waiting for questions, I'm going to go ahead and throw out a, our, our first question to Tamara. And Tamara, that is, um, you had mentioned about the research and how there's um, little, you said 14 studies. So I was just wondering in terms of, um, of that, where do you see um, dual language learners research going? Well, that's a great question. I, I should have uh, elaborated further. Since the focus is on social emotional development, I didn't really go into all of the research there is on dual language learners' language development and cognitive development, but that literature is much uh, more robust and is ongoing. So there is a lot of research out there. It just the, so the research on their social emotional development is, is rather sparse at this time. And so I'm, I am hopeful that more uh, research will be done on this population starting in infancy because one of the most important features of social emotional development is attachment. And uh, attachment theory uh, states that you start in infancy to develop a, um, an important relationship and secure base with primary caregivers and that those relationships kind of um, affect 
all future um, in social relationships in a person's life or can have that effect. So um, I, I'm hopeful that more research will be done um, during the infant and toddler period, um, especially not only on um, their social emotional development, but also on their language development and how children can become fluently bilingual, which is another feature that we didn't really go into, but one of the goals um, that I believe we should be having in supporting not only children's English language fluency, but also fluency in the home language so that children will ultimately become uh, fluent bilingual or, or multilingual uh, individuals, and this I feel is important because in a uh, global economy that we now have, it behooves us to to support everybody's um, development in this area to be able to communicate and interact in more than one language. Um, and young dual language learners are starting out with a good start to becoming fluent bilinguals, and when when their home language is not supported in enough. They could lose they could lose that language as they develop fluency in English here in the United States because it's the dominant primary language of, of the culture. Um, so Thanks. That, that's my long-winded answer to that question. <laughs> no, that was a great that was a great response. Um, I hope to see I hope to see that research come about. Yeah. Oh, can I just mention one other thing about research? I I sure. said in the um, there's another point that. We made in in the paper, the longer literature review paper about this, and that is that, and I and I kind of alluded to it earlier. Um, we don't have a single, even though we have a single definition of uh, dual language learners that we're using the Office of Head Start definition. In the research field, we don't have a consistent way that we're defining or identifying dual language learners or potential dual language learners, and I. I feel like it, the research community needs to do a better job of, um, of first of all, having a, a coherent and consistent operational definition of dual language learners for research purposes. And we also need to um, have better measures of children's developmental abilities that are appropriate for use for children who are um, learning more than one language. Many of the, often we have measures that are developed for English speaking children that get adapted or just translated um, for children who speak another language primarily. But that is not always the most appropriate thing to do for children who are learning simultaneously two languages. So we need more measures development as well as uh, better definitions, operational definitions from a research perspective, in my opinion. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and take a question from the chat box um, that came up. And this is from our Oregon fellow. Um, he has two questions. I'm going to start with the first. Uh, looks like he wants to dig a little deeper into the literature review. Um, does the literature show differences between dual language boys and girls? That's a great question. There were very few studies that, um, first of all, examined gender differences, and second of all, had a large enough sample size to do so. But um, there are some very subtle differences between um, boys and girls um, where girls tend to have, and this is in general, they tend to have more advanced social skills um, than boys. One, um, one study I'm remembering was doing an analysis of, um, that was more kind of based on social cognition on children's use of emotion words and found that girls were more likely to use emotion words than boys. But I'm not sure that that's like a huge difference um, that has kind of a functional um, meaning um, from, okay. a, from a policy perspective necessarily. But, um, but yes, there needs to be more research that, that kind of looks at more of the nuances within groups. And I should say that there are there is variation. So even though I said they tend to be do less well on cognitive and uh, like uh, math and reading assessments, that's generally as a group. There is variability among dual language learners, um, not only based on their English proficiency, but uh, on other factors as well. Thanks. That's great. Um, so his second part of this question is. Um, 
are there models for using volunteers with, with proficiency in the languages in the classrooms to come in and support class activities? Oh, that's a great question. I am not familiar with any of those, with models such as that, but I do know that there are different um, curricula that have been developed, supported by, I think the U.S. Department of Education um, supported a couple of uh, curriculum development uh, grants, one of, at least one of which was um, creating a curriculum that was um, for classrooms with dual language learners. And that may that curriculum um, or um, activities in the classroom may involve as a component volunteers with proficiency in the in the home language in the classroom. But I I'm not familiar enough with it to be able to speak um, very definitively about that that particular component of a model. It can't okay. I, I think just from a standpoint of it can't hurt to have somebody who can understand a child whose primary language is, is other than English, um, especially if it's a low frequency language. Like we know Spanish is, is a very prominent language of, of dual language learners, but if there's a child who's, uh, and it, it's possibly easier to find um, people who, who have that, um, who have a, some Spanish language um, fluency, but somebody who's like Hmong might, might be needed in a classroom if the teacher doesn't have that fluency. Right, right, exactly. Um, I'm going to go to, um, there's another question in the chat box, but I'm going to first ask the operator to see if there are any questions lined up on the phone line. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question or comment, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. And if you have a question that you'd like to type in the chat box, you can type in the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and hit the send button in order to enter the chat box queue. Uh, we're going to please wait while we poll for more questions. So do we currently have a question on the phone line? No, we do not, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Um, so in the chat box, another question is, I have heard a lot of, of good recommendations for policy programming uh, regarding ELL. Are there any legislative policy needs that you recommend? Um, sort of I, I do not <laughs> have any. Yeah. I'm sort of putting you on the hot seat here. Uh, yeah, I know. I, I'm sorry. I um, also because you know we d we're kind of nonpartisan. We don't have a particular legislative agenda that we're trying to push. So I don't think in those terms all the time. But um, I'd be happy if there is some legislative um, policies that are being considered at a state level, and um, you want a research perspective on on those recommendations or those policies, I'd be happy to um, provide that on an individual basis from a research perspective. Yeah, that sounds great. And I was just going to follow up that um, that that is a role of NCSL is to look for these legislative uh, policies. So I think this is our, our charge here at NCSL to see what we can find, and we will certainly uh, forward any information that we come up with um, uh, to the fellows group. So that is my response to, to that question. I know that there are some legislative examples of where states have uh, put in statute um, uh, a requirement to use culturally relevant uh, early childhood literature. Um, um, so I will uh, forward that information out to the group. Um, but as I said, we'll, we're going to go ahead and, and look to see if there are other policy examples that would be informative to, to the group. Right. And there is uh, a, a piece that we did. I don't believe it's out yet, however, um, but you might want to check with BUILD. Are you familiar with BUILD? Um, yes. It's a group. Yes. Um, they they do a lot of support to states around quality rating and improvement systems and race to the top. And um, we did a, a scan of quality rating and improvement systems and what they're doing specifically related to dual language learners within QRIS. And we did a summary on that for them that I'm not sure has been disseminated yet, but you might want to check in with them about that and what the plans for dissemination. Sure. And I think that follows, um, in my mind, uh, another question that I had for, for you, not necessarily a, an answer, but just more of a reflection of, you had mentioned research-based curricula, and a lot of states have, in their early learning guidelines and standards, reference to curricula. So 
So I was just wondering if you are familiar with any states that reference DLL or, um, or if that would be a good place for where a state could potentially have a policy uh, influence. Right. Um, well, as I mentioned, there have been some research-based curricula that were uh, supported by U.S. Department of Education in their development specifically for uh, a dual language uh, learner population. Um, there are also, uh, there's also a feeling that good research-based curricula will be beneficial to dual language learners as, they, as it is for non-dual language learners. Um, as long as there are some additional supports, as I mentioned, available in the classroom for, for those children. Um, so I think as long as it is um, a research-based curricula, and there are plen plenty out there that are, but there might be some that are specific. If, if a state has a high proportion of dual language learners in their, in their schools, they may want to um, look for a curricula that specifically has uh, been done, uh, created based on research on what supports dual language learners development. And there are a few out there. Sure, sure. Um, you had mentioned that uh, a lot of the research comes from the Head Start population. I think you had referenced it, correct? Uh, the, well, the definition that I pulled up was from the um, Office of Head Start, and, and that is the one that's kind of um, typically used. And Head Start does have a very large uh, proportion of children whose home language is not English um, in Head Start. Uh, so, the, so this population is of interest and concern to the Head Start community as well. I'm just curious to know if Head Start has form some sort of policy guidelines around DLL since they have now a definition of DLL. And that I think they may have. Um, I, I guess I can look that up. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but um, they, they likely do. <laughs> again, putting, again, putting you on the hot seat, but just more thinking through some of these possible policy levers that states can think about. Yes, yes. Yes, and a lot of it has to do with um, appropriate use of assessment, and that gets back to my issue for the research community about measures development. Um, we also did for um, the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, we did a compendium of measures that are appropriate uh, screeners and assessments that are appropriate for use with young children, and in that, um, in that compendium of measures, which I can send you the link to after this webinar if you'd like to share it. It was written in a way that, um, that it was primarily written because there was this requirement that Head Start communities need to assess children in, um, with assessments that are appropriate for the age, language, and culture of their participants. And because there's such a large proportion of dual language learners, we reviewed the assessments with regard to uh, their appropriateness for children whose home language is not English and for children who have disabilities. And the compendium is written in a way that it is accessible to lay people. It's not full of a lot of psychometric jargon. Um, and it compare, there's some summary tables that compare assessments um, on, on various characteristics. And so you can, there, there's these kind of cross-cutting tables, so you can kind of compare the, the assessments, and there's also profiles of the individual assessments. So that is, I can provide you with a link to that, and that was definitely an outgrowth, um, that, that tool was created because there was this mandate among Head Start programs that they needed to use assessments that were appropriate for the children in their program. Thanks. So just to summarize, there are some policy levers out there that legislators could potentially tap into assessments, QRIS, early learning guidelines, um, curricula. So, um, and as this is emerging, I think that we will look more into this and like I said before, that we will get any information out to the fellows um, regarding it. So, are there any, um, any questions on the phone line? Ma'am, at this time there are no questions on the queue. 
Okay, and I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Then I am going to close out this portion of our uh, webinar. I want to thank Tamara for her, her insightful presentation on this emerging issue. Obviously, there's a lot more to talk about, and I think we will be talking about this more in the future. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the webinar will be archived, and Allison will be sending out an email soon. And we also have some other, uh, we will have some other resources available on the web on dual language learners uh, mentioned here on the call, and then also. Um, uh, Tamara was part of a Child Trends blog that we're going to go ahead and, and forward to you all just so that you have the background information as you more, move forward on this issue in your state. So this time I'm going to turn over the webinar to Robin who's going to conclude the, the webinar. Thanks. Hi everyone, this is Robin and thank you again all for being on the call. We really appreciate your interest and your time. Um, in participating, and I do hope this webinar provided you some new information for you to think about as you um, move forward in crafting policy. It is an emerging issue, and I think it's something that's on the minds of many, many people as the demographics in our country um, are changing. So, excuse me, with that, this webinar concludes our formal programming for the 2014 third year class of the Early Learning Fellows. But not to fear, you will always be considered an early learning alum and still receive um, important information from us on issues related to early learning and the same um, support and assistance that we give to you while you were a fellow. We encourage everyone to remember that the listserv is here for you to share relevant information and to network with your fellow colleagues. And again, we really encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, a few other things in your um, inbox you should have already received from me um, or shortly receiving an email including your early learning plan with some specific resources that NCSL has for you to assist in putting your plan in place. Um, you know, remember we're here for you. We're able to assist you and your state colleagues with implementing your plan or thinking through how to address needs related to early care and education. Um, for an example of resources, we're able to travel to your state, um, present relevant information to a committee or a task force, testify in front of a legislature. We can assist in better understanding how states are tackling policy as it relates to children prenatal through five. And of course, we have our 50 state legislative tracking that many find useful. We also plan to send out an email today titled Early Learning Fellows Quality Improvement Survey. The survey has um, five very simple questions. It shouldn't take you more than two to three minutes to finish it out. I'm asking for your opinion and feedback on the design of the fellows program. So essentially wanting to know your opinion on the optimal number of face-to-face -face meetings, webinars, as well as the frequency of both in, as we plan for future years. Our group one, um, there's just some background. Our group, our first year fellows had one face-to-face -face meeting with four webinars, and our years two and three had two face-to-face -face meetings with two webinars. So as we think about how to plan for future years, we're just looking for your input. Um, we really certainly realize how busy everyone is this time of year, but if you're able, again, to take just a few moments out of your day and quickly reply to the email answering the questions, we would love to hear from you. Again, remember that NCSL is here for you. If you have any comments or feedback, please feel free to email any staff member on the Early Care and Education Project team or on the listserv. There are many useful resources on NCSL's website. Additionally, an archived copy of this webinar will be available shortly. An email will be sent around once the archived version is available. So again, thank you and have a great rest of your day.